Hi. Before we get into this week's episode, I wanted to let you know about some bonus content from Spotlight On. Head over to spotlightonpodcast.com slash blog and check out Bonus Tracks, the official blog of this podcast. There you'll find special material exclusive to the website, including music recommendations, artist interviews, essays, and more. Have a look. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight shines on internationally renowned bass player and composer Bruno Reberg. Since coming to the U.S. from his native Sweden in 1981, Bruno's made many recordings as a leader and a sideman, and he's performed with an incredible number of world-class artists, including Terry Lynn Carrington, Sam Rivers, Donnie McCaslin, Billy Hart, Matt Wilson, and countless, countless others. He currently leads several incarnations of his own Bruno Rayberry Trio and the Triloka Ensemble. Bruno's been a professor at the Berklee College of Music in Boston since 1986 and teaches in the prestigious Berklee Global Jazz Institute. He joins us to talk about Look Inside, his debut album for solo bass, which came out on May 19th. If you're curious about what took him so long to embark on such a project, and I was, your questions will be answered here. I enjoyed my time with Bruno, and I hope you do as well. We're here on the occasion of your album, Look Inside, which is going to be out on May 19th. Yes. Before we dig into some of the specifics of that, I wonder if both for our listeners and maybe for my benefit, we could talk a little bit about your background and your history. I promise we'll spend the majority of the time talking about the record, but I'd love to set the table a little bit. Yeah, sure. My understanding in your biography is that you came to the States in the early 80s, 1981, as part of a scholarship for Berkeley. I wonder if you could talk a little bit for me about your life, your experience, how you came into musical awareness before you came to the States? When did you get exposed to jazz and classical music? Did you grow up around that? If you could just give me a little bit of your sort of musical story. So I grew up on a farm in Sweden, kind of in the middle of Sweden. You know, it was farmland, farm country. My sisters played a little bit of music, one played guitar, one played piano. My parents were just farmers that didn't really have a chance to study music or pursue that, even if they had wanted to. And I started playing in the pop group called The Farmers. Basically, they, they needed a bass player, and I, I didn't even know what that was, basically. Because this is like mid-60s, or let's see, 54, yeah, so 66, probably. I managed to get, a, get an electric bass, and that's how it started, really, which I fell in love with right away. I also played some guitar and accordion. So we played with a pop group that developed into another group that later, I was 12 and a half when I started with that. And we had a blast. We played on the weekends, we rehearsed the 24 hours, Saturday, Sunday, we had, it was such a blast. I'm still in contact with those guys actually. Oh. And then through that, I started listening more and more to, I'd say before jazz was groups like Cream and Doors and Beatles, of course. But also I started listening to blues, and that became a, a really important part of, of my playing, because I started playing blues guitar. Yeah, and then I evolved, started hearing, at least more and more to jazz music, going from more instrumental, rock, hard rock, like Cream and Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, things like that. During this whole thing, I was also listening to and playing some Swedish folk music, traditional folk music. I went to a conservatory for one year in the area where I lived. And there, the legendary trombonist, Aetilin, heard me play in a clinic. So he invited me to come to Stockholm and rehearse with his group. That was a big thing. I was 19 then. The -hmm. bass player that was in his band was Paula Danielsson, who had gotten recruited for the Keith Jarrett Scandinavian Quartet. And I just started listening to all that. So it was, it was really big shoes to fill. 
so to speak. And they moved fast. I, I'd never been to Stockholm before, you know, it, it was very intimidating in many ways. So I managed to move up and uh, spent four years with Italy's group. And we toured all over Europe. We played the Monterey Jazz Festival and Storyville in New York. Played it twice. Once on the way to California and they wanted us back. So we played on the way back also. The, on the way back, Charles Mingus was there listening. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, exactly. No pressure. <laughs> We're stealing two tables from the stage. Um, there was a mix of ignorance and arrogance that's kind of saved me, you know? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So to speak. I was, yeah. I was 22 at the time. But he was interested in a drummer, Leroy Lowe, who was from the U.S., from Washington, actually, but had uh, moved to Stockholm, that lived, so he lived there. Uh, and he also knew about the Italians, so he was there scouting about them stuff. But we played, and uh, in the break, I remember going to the bathroom, and was standing in the bathroom in the stall, and I hear this kind of dwarf flings open, and it was quite noisy. And it was Vegas coming in and uh, was standing next to me. And he looks over, I feel he's like looking at me. And I'm thinking, oh shit, something's going to go down here. <laughs> but he goes, you're all right, man. You're all right. Oh. And so <laughs> that was like, a, that was like the blessing, you know. That is beautiful. I mean, it, was, it was really cool. Yeah, definitely. But in Stockholm, you know, what was interesting, especially you look at in retrospect is that there was such a melting pot. There was one club in Old Town in Stockholm called Café Ricardo that where you played week-long engagements, sometimes two weeks engagements. And that's where musicians from Africa, South America, Sweden, of course, met up. And so it was like a fusion. It was like Latin bands and African groove, high life. And like this mix, because there wasn't enough, maybe a enough African musicians to only have an all African band. Therefore, there had to be Swedish musicians in there and Latin musicians. And so it was like a real incredible place, really, in, in retrospect. I took it for granted then, but I ended up playing in many situations. And really, th those musicians um, didn't really know how to teach or explain things. So it's more like jumping in and figuring it out on stage, basically. But that was a really great learning experience that stays with me. It, I don't know if you can, if you have the context to perceive this in your own story, but just hearing you talk about your journey, there's an element of such unlikeliness to it. A young person from a, a rural part of Europe at a very young age to be standing in a stall next to Mingus. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's an element of beauty to that as well. What was available when you were coming up in terms of like, how did you access music? Oftentimes we have maybe an older sibling or there's a record store you can go to where you get your tutelage from, a, you know, the guy or whatever. Who and how did you explore? How did you come to, you know, unfold the world of music? I'm a great question because there wasn't, the access was, of course, almost non-existent, but... <laughs> The turn, my sisters, I have two older sisters, they got a turntable. Uh. And I was probably around 10 then, I think. I think there was an LP that came with the turntable. And basically they said, you can't touch our LPs. There was Elvis and um, various, you know, stuff. And Swedish dance music, I think. But you can have this one, because we don't really think this one. And I forgot all about it till I was like in my thirties, I was visiting my sister and I found this LP, like the cover looked really recognizable and I put it on and I knew the whole album, the solos, everything. And it was an album called, um, Hammond the Go-Go and it's with Johnny Hodges Ooh. and Wild Bill Davidson on organ, uh, Milt Hint on bass. Wow. I can't remember, and guitar and drum. I can't remember what a guitar and drums on top of my head right now. And then I remembered that I played that over and over when I was maybe nine, 10 years old without knowing what it was or anything. <laughs> and I still love it, you know. That's pretty hip. It's pretty hip, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really nice album. 
<laughs> they play like Sunny Side of the Street and uh, Johnny Come Lately and Little Darling, Green Dolphin Street also, yeah. But other than that, then when I, when I was going to join the pop group, we saved money up for LPs, Beatles and all those things. But I should say one really important thing was the public library in the city, the closest city, because they had a record collection and the listening room. Yeah. So that's where I started spending time when I, I moved into the city to study. And that's where I, that's where I heard train the first time. And that was like a big revelation, com complete couple of different albums, but I took one out and brought it to a party with the farm boys that played. There was basically Creedence Clearwater Revival, that the only thing that would spin. But by the time everybody had passed out, I put this on and it was giant steps. It was just in some weird ways, this is what I want to do. This is it. This is what I want to do in uh, being 15 years old. You put how much you can think of that then. But it was something about it. One thing was just the spirituality of it that just spoke to me. And it spoke, in, I think, in a very similar way that the blues artists that I've been listening to and the British bands clapped on and, and it could have tied in with that for me. I think it also was that I didn't understand what the hell they were doing it harmonically. And, and, and as far as the rock and the blues, I, I kind of understood all the chords. I heard that right away what was went on. But like giant steps, what, what's going on here, you know? Yeah. I think that also was a part that intrigued me. Like, I got to learn to do this because this is really hip, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, the first Coltrane I heard was, uh, was Africa Brass and I was a teenager. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was utterly unprepared for it. My ear had no idea what to make of it. Yeah. There were artists that I liked who talked about him and who talked about that album as being important to them. So I said, well, I'm just going to keep trying to listen to it. And ultimately, I was able to find my way in somehow. And now it's one of my favorite pieces of work. But it was to your point, like my ear didn't understand. It had no context for it. It was so dense. Right. <laughs> I knew. Yeah. 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 Before we leave that era, I just want to ask one other quick question. What is Swedish folk music? Like, what's the instrumentation? What's the tradition of it? Would I recognize any trace of it in popular music at all? Or is it a living tradition? It is a living tradition very much. It's really fiddle music. Oh. On, but it, that's the main instrument, the violin. But it's also played on something called a key harp or nicken harp. With, it's, it's like a violin type of instrument you're holding in your lap. And it has keys that you press, that press on the strings. That's also a very common instrument for that. There's also the munharpe, or mouth harp, which is called juice harp, which is kind of the derogatory term, I'm sure. But um, that's, you know, an instrument that's common all over the world, really. So there's some music for that also. So that music ties in with, especially with Norwegian and Swedish, they tie in together. There's differences, but a lot of similarities too. There's a group called the Heathen, Heathens, I think it's a Finnish group that does that kind of music with, a, with grooves, with contemporary grooves. And it's very intricate music with a lot of intricate microtonal embellishment, intonation. And it's dance music meant for dancing. A lot of it's in three, and they can be eighth note subdivision or triplet or sixteenth note subdivision, and the beat kind of tunes. Do you see any connection between being able to either having grown up around that music or being able to hear that music and your affinity and connection with, say, musics of Africa or India, you know, other musics that are either microtonal or dance based or, you know, that sort of ritual celebration based? Is there a through line there or am mm -hmm. I am I overreaching? No, that, there's definitely similarities. Yeah. There's no percussion in the Swedish or Norwegian folk music. And um, I, I, I'm a little shaky on the history of that, but at one point when the church, when Christianity came to Sweden, they kind of forbid the fiddle, they, they forbid dancing, first of all, and any instrument that would make people dance, except in the king's castle, whatever. 
would be forbidden. So I don't know much about about the history of that. But in Ireland, you have the Bodrain, I think it's called Bodrain, uh, which is the frame drum that's very prominent. And Africa, of course, but I'm thinking about Northern Europe, that there, there are percussion instruments in Ireland and Scotland, et cetera. But Sweden don't have that. But there's, there, I mean, there's a lot of connections, yes. You know, some pieces with triplet feel that uh, I can hear as I could hear with African drums. As a matter of fact, on, on my album called Orbis, that came out in 96, I think, 97, I am exploring that. With, that's with Bob Moses on drums, and Tim Rake piano, and Ole Mathison on saxophones. He's from Norway. There's there's some pieces that are based on groups from the Swedish and Norwegian folk music that sounds African, similar to African groups. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating. So there are, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> <Big> yeah. <time>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll be back with more Spotlight On after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. Let me bring the conversation around to what you're working on now, or what's about to come out, rather. The most obvious thing that strikes me is, I guess the easiest way to ask is like, why now? Or what circumstances had to present themselves in order for you to take on the idea of a solo bass album? It's been on my mind for a while, because there was some milestone solo bass albums that I really love. I could mention... Well, there's Dave Holland's Emerald Tears. Yeah, great. Album. ECM. Yeah, 75, maybe yeah. around there, yeah. mid 70s. And the other one that I, has been is really one of my favorites is by Swedish bass player Anders Jormin. He was a member of Charles Lloyd Quartet for quite many years, I think early 2000s, so in the 90s, together with Swedish pianist Bobo Stenson. And he has an album out called Alone. It's not on ECM. He has another one out that's on ECM also. That's great. But anyway, the first two there were really started my interest in doing it. And I've been nibbling on it like over all these years, but I've been kind of too busy playing with bands and composing. So it's really the pandemic in a way mm -hmm. that, that uh, put it together. It's interesting you point to the Dave Holland record and... When I first was introduced to this album that you have coming out, I, I won't lie, I had a combination of ignorance and some trepidation. I didn't know if I was prepared to give in to a, a solo bass album for no other really good reason than just sort of uh, ignorance. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and I think part of it is not having a lot of other touchstones. I wasn't familiar with a canon or a tradition. There's the Dave Holland record. I was familiar maybe with, I think there's a, a, there's a really good Michael Manring bass album. Sure, sure. Yeah. I think there's a couple of Jonas Helborg albums, but there, you know, I, it's, again, it wasn't a, a, something I had a lot of experience with. And as I dug in, I found the album to be very, well, I will say there's a journey. And the, where I found myself completely wrapped up was the midpoint of the album in the pairing of, Prelude to a Kiss and Gyrating Spheres. That's possible, yes. Yeah. The freely improvised with tapping on the body and stuff. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Those two pieces okay. yeah. alone and together really encapsulated so much of the record for me. Oh. I wonder if you could maybe use those as a jumping off point to talk about some of the stylistic terrain you cover in the album. What was important to you in terms of a statement or as a showcase for your own abilities to get across with this record? I think number one, it really is the sound. Because when you're on your own like that, the tone of your instrument and the sound you're projecting is so unique. Two people will can impossibly sound the same on the same instrument, playing the same tune, playing the same note. And I see that as, a, as the vehicle that everything rides on, so to speak. I feel I should be able to play like one note and it should have enough, what I call spiritual velocity or saying soul and spirit that that one note is all you need <laughs> in a way. This goes back to hearing 
well, Pallet Arnhills on in Sweden many times, but it was one specific concert with Charlie Hayden, with the group, with um, John Garbarek, um, the guitarist, Brazilian guitarist, pianist. Uh, oh my God, Magico was one of the albums uh, on ECM. They did three or three albums, maybe, that I heard them live in Oslo, Norway, and Charlie has come in and played this like low note, low, low G on the E string that just, the whole place just took a big breath. And I was like, yes, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to find a way to project my sound that strongly. So that's um, something that's underpinning the whole thing, I feel like. Actually, can you repeat the question? I forgot. The... It was a very unfair rambling question. I guess the heart of the question is more about what were you hoping to showcase or get across? Is this meant to be a showing off of your technical prowess? Is it meant to be a reflection of everything that you've that's come before and you've ingested and now you want to share back out? What's the sort of why? What's the mission statement, the artistic statement? Yeah, it is to have a chance to show things I can do on the bass that, that I normally won't be able to show in a concert when I play with other people, for one. Showing off the technique, that's always something there. You know, that's like, wow, is the, are the bass player going to dig this or not? You know, that, that's the little aspect that I really try to forget. But that said, you want to have to create variety. You want to be able to have use a lot of different techniques and, and sounds. Which, because honestly, hearing a whole album with just a regular pizzicato sound, that's pretty tough. That doesn't have a lot of variety, like a piano, for example, would have. So the different techniques. But I just felt like, because I've been doing little solo intros, when I play with my quartets and stuff like that, or other bands, I do an intro for a song, and people have responded very greatly to it, saying, that's really beautiful. You should do something with just that, you know, and I, I just feel like, you know, hopefully I feel like what I'm, what I did, what I'm doing is unique for me. And that's the way, one of the goals with the album, that it's whatever happens, it's going to sound like me. No one else can play that. You know? They can play the notes, but it comes back to what I started talking about the, the individual boys being so naked in that context, whereas with a group, it's there, but maybe not as clear. Yeah. And one more aspect, it's like, I think it's also the constant search of trying to become a better musician. It was a learning process to put it together. You talked about that. You used the word being naked or bare in the making of the album. Did, did you feel a vulnerability? Did you feel exposed? Like, was it, was it intimidating at all? Yeah, I felt that. Because in the band, you, you, you're covered and you can blame somebody else. <laughs> that, that damn drummer's out of time <laughs> exactly precisely <laughs> so uh, I, yeah. I, I tried to blame the microphone but it didn't work you know yeah but uh yeah. yeah so that was that was definitely really hard i recorded in my home studio which was good and bad good thing is like it was kind of unlimited time i had to do it although if you have a studio and you have 10 hours, then you got to do it in 10 hours kind of thing, you know? But I think I, I started recording, trying to play in a certain way and listening back. I was like, ah, this is not really good. There's a lot of aspects. I felt like I was overplaying. I tried to compensate for not having, ba having drums and piano around me, which made me overplay. I listened to it and... The more I, I record and listen, I, the more I was able to like boil it down to the essence and place less and less and really go for the sound and believe in, in that vehicle that the sound will carry you yeah. rather than the, the amount of notes, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that and I'm glad you brought it up because I couldn't think of a <laughs> polite way to ask and the question was going to be... <laughs> How do you avoid becoming self-indulgent in that type of an environment when it's, or even to say it less negatively, you know, you have to be basically your own editor and your own producer. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that has its own set of excitements and challenges. Yeah, it does. Because I have pretty 
long experience teaching also. Yeah. And I mean, sort of learned to recognize when even it can be a professional group or more of a student group, there's some really good players at the student level don't know how to edit. They don't know when it's enough. And that's something I'm, I'm learned to recognize. And I tell them, I'm pretty frank with them. So I go like, okay, you lost my interest, you know, which can be very subjective, of course. But uh, as you're saying, it's a really good point. So I was recording stuff and I thought, wow, this is cool. You know, I played like four courses on uh, opening to a kiss or something. And I go back and listen. And I'm like, no, one course is enough if it's good. And after the tour courses, now I'm just regurgitating. It doesn't add anything to the big picture, to the full piece. So that's a really good question. It, that was one of the main things I think that I discovered when I started recording it. As I was playing, I thought, this is really cool. And I just, no, it's not. It's too much. <laughs> and, and then, you know, that was a really good learning process. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any take or any track in particular where you felt like you had figured it out and it made the rest of the process easier? Or was there a way in when you were like, okay, I'm on to it now? Or was each track its own challenge? I think each track was its own challenge. But as I moved along with it, the knowledge carried over from one track to another. So I, I knew a little bit more how to approach each new piece. Yeah. What's your relationship with catalog? Like you, you seem to be a bit of an ECM expert. <laughs> and I wonder, is that, <laughs> what is that about? <laughs> yeah. It's like growing up in Sweden, of course, the first albums on ECM was really uh, Scandinavian groups for the most part with Arne Landerson and John Garbarek and the Boba Stenson and John Garbarek quartet with Paula Danielson and John Christensen. And that's what Manfred Eicher heard and figured out, ah, Kip Jarrett, I'm going to put him with that group. So that's how that got started. And that's, that happened in the, when I came to Stockholm in 74, all of that music started coming out. I just loved all those epic albums as much as I love the Miles different quintets and way shorter stuff from Blue Note. And I, I, at the time I listened a lot to funk also, the, that kind of stuff, Sly and Family Stone and James Brown, uh, George Duke, you know, that kind of fusion. So that was a big part at the time. But the ECM, it was like a whole other sound that was really intriguing compared with the American, so to speak, jazz albums. Ralph Towner, Solstice. Yeah, I lost track now on ECM, honestly. There's so much coming out, and I tend to lean towards the epic stuff from the 70s. You know, yeah, like, of course, so of course. Yeah. What does it mean in the class you teach, the specific course title, right? It's ECM and improv or ECM and jazz. Like, what is it? what's the significance of having that in the course title? What do students take that class expecting? Yeah, it's called ECM slash free jazz. When I started teaching at Berkeley in 1986, there was literally no one teaching any of that music. It was one, one or two uh, Kenny Wheeler tunes, Smatter, that people played. And a lot of people didn't know who the artists on that label were at all. It was such a divide at the time. So I just started an ensemble doing that, and I'm still doing it. So we did a lot of Kenny Wheeler and John Abercrombie, Keith Jarrett, all those artists, mainly that material. They've all done, of course. It's silly to have a, a record label name as for an ensemble, but I figured that's, that was the best. Everybody understood what it was then, basically. Right, it's a shorthand for a certain style or mindset. Yeah, exactly. It's really interesting what you talk about, Bruno, with, the, with that time period of the mid-late 80s and where the state of jazz education was, what was considered the canon at that point, and just where jazz was as a form. I've talked to some other guests about this, especially people who came up in the late 70s, early 80s in particular, who, you know, there was, there was such a backlash to the 70s and the neo-traditionalists, I guess, if you will, like the Wynton Marsalis camp. Mm -hmm. and, it was a strange time and there was this period where it was always, you know, is jazz dead? 
that's what I came up with as a listener. Like all the best jazz has been made was sort of the mindset. I grew up in the East Coast of America, so I had ready proximity to New York. And I never felt like jazz was dead. You know, you could go see something very traditional or you could go downtown and you could go see John Zorn or, you know, anything like that. And I wonder, what did you think you were getting into as a young person exploring and trying to make a life in this field, this genre? Did it feel alive to you? Did you feel like you had a role in preservation? Did you feel there was still ground to uncover? Like, do you recall like what your mindset was as a player? I don't know. I just had a blast playing. And you think it wasn't much thought that went into it really, but I played traditional gigs. When I came to Boston, I would play with older musicians. I played show tunes. I didn't know any tunes or what they were playing because they weren't in the real book. You know, they kept calling me back. And I said, well, so why are you guys calling me back? I don't know any of the tunes. And the one guy says, you have good tone, a good time, and you hear when you're wrong. <laughs> so, but you had a 90% of the other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just ate anything, you know, and I, I actually didn't go to Berkeley. I went to New York Conservatory, which of course had a tradition with the third stream. Gunter Schroeder, et cetera. So there I played classical, I played with students, senior classical recitals, experimental classical music, to classical music and anything in between, all the jazz stuff. All those years, I was like, really like, I just want to learn to play anything good. But I never felt like jazz was dead, you know? I guess the only way an art form would die is if it stops developing. You know, I take Wayne Shorter as an example, and Miles. You take Wayne Shorter, like, if you were that great post bop tenor saxophonist, like with Blakey and his own albums, like, why would you want to do anything else if you were that good? <laughs> you know, but he just kept going. He left, we have to left the Beyonce and Miles. We were able to leave that behind, which is incomprehensible to me in a way when you, when you achieve come to such a high level in a certain mode or style part of jazz that, that you want to leave that. But they both did it. It was it's, it's really remarkable. But to come back to it, I think any art form will die if it doesn't continue. And I think sometimes the uh, continuation, the new material that comes up at first might not sound as good as the one, the material that happened 10 years earlier. And that's fine because it, it's just being born. New stuff is being born and it's not going to be perfect and refined until it has some time. So that's also part of the process to, I think, to be able to let things, you know, sound the way they sound in a way. What you're saying there reminds me of the famous downbeat article after Coltrane and Eric Dolphy played at the Village Vanguard in the fall. Mm -hmm. of, I guess it was 61. And that spring, there was the, this downbeat article about how they were not making jazz and they were destroying the music. And they, the article really like held them to account of like, what, what is it that you think you're doing? It's, it's hard to believe as a listener with the space of 60 years and how just incredible that music is. I can understand, I suppose, hearing some of the droning and the Indian influence about why it confounded listeners in the moment, but certainly nothing they need to apologize for. <laughs> but it speaks right. to your idea that it took time. It took time for people to be able to integrate that into their expectation of jazz. And for the musicians to, to refine it too, or, you know, make it more solid, so to speak. Yeah. A couple other questions before I let you go. Did you play the same instrument across this album? Yeah, it's the same instrument. Uh, it's a French made instrument from like around 1880 in the mirror court area of France. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful tone. Beautiful tone. Thank you. Record. Yeah. Really wonderful. I see you have an album release show. Is there some enthusiasm about now you have to do this in front of people? <laughs> How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> I like I like the word enthusiasm <laughs> instead of uh, fear and <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm getting stoked for that. I've never done that. I've never done the full concert just by myself. So I'm very focused on that right now. I have some new pieces I want to do also. 
I'm just trying to come up with uh, maybe 40, 40, 45 minutes set or so and have the variety. We talked about that a little bit before that the album we talked about that I'm doing art and stuff, the pizzicato, regular pizzicato, so to speak. And also when I tap on the body of the bass and play on the strings below the bridge, I, I think it's very hard for me anyway to keep it interesting for like 45 minutes just playing the regular pizzicato. So I really want to take the audience to different sonic places and myself too. That's really important. So I'm working, working on that. I'm actually the tapping I'm studying or I'm looking into uh, the techniques from the Indian Gatam players do, the clay drum and using some of that. So I'm really practicing. It's not just I'm flailing around on the body of the bass. I'm practicing with the metronome and try to be, uh, have some control over those movements and sounds, bring out different sounds of the body. That's interesting you say that because that came across to me, especially in the piece we were talking about before where it's featured so prominently. One thing mm -hmm. that struck me as a listener was that it it did seem very purposeful and not studied, not forced in any way, but you could feel the learning or the intention behind it. Yeah, it very much came Oh, through. thank you. So I've done it before even in a different context. And, and maybe it was I did some game with a percussionist also more like free year and I realized that I shouldn't really just start banging around on the bass when I have this percussion this next to me that spent hours, <laughs> you know, learning. Yeah, so I felt like I should, I should really work on it that way. And I have been uh, really blessed with getting to know a pianist, Chris Davis, and she's moved up to Boston area. I'm really blown away by her playing, composing, and as a free player. When I hear, I can really tell it. She just really worked on stuff that she's playing. She's really worked on different concepts and techniques that you want to be used in a free context and not just playing completely randomly free, which can be fine too. But so that's been really inspiring, especially when doing solo concert like this. It's good to have those. So yeah, I could call them like their practiced material but they will sound different every time because the way they put together. Because I might get into something when I'm playing at home, some new weird thing I'm doing, and I like the sound, but I can't quite pull it off. So then I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, let me, let me slow this down and practice it, analyze it, see what's going on with the hands and how they interact, if it's percussive in there and stuff like that. And I practice it so it becomes part of my vocabulary. Do you think that this form is one you'll continue to explore? I know you're, you're identified a lot with the trio format and obviously other types of formats, but do you think there's more to uncover as a solo artist? Yeah, I want to continue to see how this concept goes, but I'm expecting to be doing more as to solo basis in the, in the future. Wonderful. Uh, it's also easier to book a tour. <laughs> just, just one person. <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> absolutely well thank you thank you for, for I, oh, actually i want to thank you for a few things thank you for challenging my assumptions about music and what what this album could be it will definitely open my ears now to explore more solo bass recordings and thank you overall for making time today i really appreciate talking with you it's all my pleasure i'm happy it was a great great talking to you i'm happy to dug it and all that and uh, i should mention i'm i recently recorded a uh, recording for 10 piece band. So, going the opposite of the <laughs> solo completely. That's going to be out hopefully early 24. It's six horns and four in the rhythm section. And I, Chris Davis is playing on half of it. And uh, Walter Smith, the saxophonist, is playing on half of it. Uh, I don't know if you're Alan Chase. Does that ring a bell? Saxophonist. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of my closest friends, by the way. He's on it, and uh, yeah, so six horns that doubling over various things, and then guitar, bass, drums, organ, and stuff like that. Wow, all right, yeah, so the extremes, you know. <laughs> Thank you, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you so much, Bruno Rayberry. As always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. 
I'm your host and executive producer, Lawrence Purrier. We're produced and edited by Michael Donaldson, and our theme music is by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. If you like what you've heard, please share us with a friend and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. For past episodes, web-only exclusives, and to join our mailing list, visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch.